continuing our series on spiritual warfare. Uh, and so you've heard me already starting to touch something this morning with the children. You heard it in the text from 1 John 4. Uh, but we're going to look at a story in the Old Testament. It's one of my favorite Old Testament stories. Uh, hopefully I don't say that with every Old Testament story, but <laughs> if I do, then they're all good. <laughs> but it's one of my favorite ones. And, and today I want to ask you, can, can you discern spirits? Do you have the ability to recognize demonic forces? Or would you just say, no, nah, there's no such thing as demons. It's just a symbol of evil. It's just a kind of a way of thinking, a philosophy. But thank God, well, maybe God's just a philosophy too. But thank God that there's not real, real demons out there, that there's really no Satan out there. And... And see, there's a problem, isn't there? If there are no demons, and there is no Satan, which are supernatural forces, then wouldn't we also come to the same conclusion there's no God? So today we want to try to understand and discern how do we recognize, how do we discern spiritual forces? How do we discern? And what I'm asking is that God will give us the ability to develop discernment and to develop spiritual eyes. And God, right now, it's going to be easy for us to get distracted, maybe by just the comments that I'm making or even by the movement in the room. And I pray, God, that you'll help us not to be distracted. And I confess, God, that I'm concerned that this is a serious and significant issue in our world. Both a recognition of you, God, that you are real and exist. You are the creator. You are greater than all of life. You truly are God, the only God. And that there are spiritual forces that stand against you, who rebel against you and your love and your authority, and who want to attach themselves or even take up residence within people, who want to harass, who want to deceive. Even their leader stands in heaven and accuses the brethren night and day. They want to shame us, guilt us, and keep us in some form of bondage so that we will not be able to have full joy and life as you want us to have it. And God, don't let us be distracted by the images of Hollywood that want to sensitize and intensify our emotions and yet cause us not to believe in their existence. So I pray for eyes to see today, God. I pray for ears to be able to hear your truth I pray that your spirit would remove barriers, especially those in our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the story is from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 to 18. 2 Kings chapter 6. Where's 2 Kings? Well, kind of, well, it's before Psalms. It's kind of in the middle of the section before the Psalms in the Old Testament. First, first and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. Those are six books all there together. 2 Kings, the sixth chapter. Make sure you're in 2 Kings or you'll be confused, not 1 Kings. And that doesn't mean that there are only two kings. It's just that there's two kings books. 2 Kings. Now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God time and again. 
Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me which of us on the si is on the side of the king of Israel. He's trying to find the traitor in the crowd. None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. So Elisha must have had some kind of microphone in the king of Aram's bedroom, right? You know, or I guess he was um, had a bug in the office or something like that. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. It's a city nearby. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Now, are you seeing this picture, by the way? So Elisha has been telling the king of Israel, here's where the king of Aram's at. And every time he finds that out, it's like king of Aram is like, what's going on here? Who's telling him? Who's giving him our secrets? And his leaders say, it's, it's, it's Elisha. It's the prophet. He keeps going to the king of Israel and warning him ahead of time. So the king of Aram says, great, we're going to go take care of, the king of uh, Elisha. And he sends a whole bunch of chariots, a whole bunch of soldiers, and they surround this little city called Dotham. It'd be like surrounding Crestline. And, and, it, and the whole downtown surrounded now with all these soldiers, and they're coming there for one purpose, to get one guy. Wouldn't that be fun? If we had our church surrounded right now and they were here to get Lonnie. We'd all be glad if it was Lonnie, just not one of the rest of us, right? <laughs> Sorry, Lonnie. <laughs> but, but you're big enough. You can handle it, right? You can take on 10 of them. <laughs> so here's, here's Elisha, and, he, and, and here's the servant, and the servant goes out and, oh, no, they're all around the city, and they're here for you, Elisha. I think I'm out of here, Elisha. You want to have another servant, don't you? And, and Elisha says, don't worry about this. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And like, he's like, really? Um, um, Elisha thinks just you and me here? Um, I mean, you think the townspeople have left? I think we're in big trouble. Oh, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. There's more of us than there are of them. Elisha, I know you, you, your math is really off today. And then, then Elisha prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. What's just happened? We have a prayer here that some of us need to be praying today. Open our eyes, Lord, so that we may see. There are resources. There is power of God that's available to us. And that's what Elisha wants his servant to see. He says, help him to see it right now, God. See, Elisha's got this privilege. He sees things some of us don't want to see. He's watching and he's able to distinguish spiritual forces and he recognizes them. And as he looks around, he knows, okay, sure there's an army out there. Yeah, they're about to attack. It's going to be nasty for them. But there is a whole host that's even more than them with fire in their chariots. There's power that they've got that's way greater than the power. And so what does he do? He says, okay, attack them. But how does he attack with another prayer, says, attack them, make them all blind. By the way, if you read on in 1 Kings, if you get bored during the message, read on, because there's a great more story, a lot more to this story. They're actually going to go, and, and Elisha's going to take them all, all these blind soldiers, out of their chariots, leave their plunder there, going to take them into a city in Samaria, put them right in the middle of the town, where they're going to be surrounded by, by Jews, and then, and then he's going to let them see, <laughs> oh no, we're in big trouble. 
We were surrounding a little town. Now we're surrounded. Anyways, that's more of the story. The prayer I want you to be thinking about this morning is this prayer, God, give us eyes to see what you see. A few years ago, we held a leadership encounter. Um, some of you know that we were going through some significant spiritual issues uh, over the history of this church. Um, just to, to enlighten you, there, there were some times that, um, right, Connie? <laughs> there were some times that, that we had just a little bit of conflict related to worship. More than once, there were actually some worship leaders that were going to go at fist together against one another. I, I still remember the day uh, that I was aware of when two worship leaders, actually, they called, the wife called the police on, the, on these two worship leaders who were getting ready to have a, a, some other kind of disagreement. And worship, sadly, worship can really be a point of contention in churches. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that some people like different styles of music? I, I remember back in the 70s, yeah, I'm that old. I remember back in the 70s when they ha brought this, folks, you're, you're not going to believe this. They brought this evil thing into the church. It was a six-stringed instrument that people played like this. Instead of playing like this, it was called a guitar. And what's more, the people that were playing them sometimes... You really are old. <laughs> We're barefoot. <laughs> but they had hair. <laughs> really long hair. And they talked ways that the other people in the church didn't talk. Sometimes, you know, all kinds of, you know, language would come out of them even when they were praising God about something. And it's like, it's like it was a total change in the whole personality of the community and all as these people, as we started referring to them as Jesus people, started coming into churches. And churches didn't know how to handle them. And, and, there, was con and there was conflict. And the sad thing is, is that over the history, there's been various conflict about the changes of music and the changes of worship styles and all. Well, it was more than that, though, here. There was a spiritual dynamic, and so we had to have a leadership encounter in which our leaders came together and say, what are we going to do about this, the spiritual forces that are at work in, this, in our church? <clears throat> in that encounter, we had a whole session on can we discern spiritual forces, and what will it take for us to, to recognize and discern them? And so I used this story. And we prayed this prayer for our leaders. Take a look at Elisha for a minute. How does he respond when his servant says, Elisha, get out of here, we're in big trouble. How does Elisha respond? He's calm. He's not upset. Like, it's okay. Because he has a sense of God's presence that calms him down in the most dangerous of moments. And that's the secret for Elisha's power, the sense of God's presence. Having gone through this study and trying to understand this text as a leadership team, we then stopped and said, okay, now, in light of this, in light of this, the, the spiritual realm that is out there, if it truly is out there, I had the group then read 1 John 4, 1 to 6. Earlier I read that to you, and then there's a couple more verses that talks about the power of God that's available to us. So we read that, and, and I emphasize this. We need to test the spirits. What I shared with them is that my bias is while we may believe that evil things and spiritual forces all went away when Jesus rose and went to heaven, my bias is that spiritual forces are still present today. Paul wrote Ephesians 6 well after, well after Christ was risen from the dead. And in Ephesians 6, he says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so you can stand against them. I actually shared with the team 
that we had had a situation where the, uh, one of our board members had actually, and I think I shared this story with some of you recently, we had a situation where one of our board members uh, saw somebody who actually was extremely raging mad. And, and I had been praying for our, for our leadership team that this prayer from Elisha, that God would give them eyes to see and, this, and we talked about this then as a, as a group here at our encounter. We said, this leader came to me and said, I actually saw a demon, Bill. Some of you say, oh, he must have been drinking something. He must have been, you know, emotionally messed up. He's a psycho. He's just a weirdo. You know, this is a very solid man, leader in our church, who saw something that he wished he hadn't seen. As he shared his story with the rest of the group that was there that day. It was very obvious it wasn't something he wanted to see. With that in mind, with that story in mind, I thought I should teach a little bit more about discernment. Robert Clinton describes the gift of distinguishing spirits from 1 Corinthians 12. He says, the discerning of spirits gift refers to the ability given by God to perceive issues in terms of spiritual truth, to know the fundamental source of the issues and to give judgment concerning those issues. This includes the recognition of spiritual forces operating in the issue. In the early church, how did they use the gift of, dis of discerning of spirits? They, they used it to dis distinguish truth from non-truth. You know, what it was when, when somebody was getting up and talking in the church, were they speaking the truth or not? In the church today, with, we've already got the Bible, right? The whole canon of Scripture available to us. The gift can be used to discern whether the teaching is on target or not. Some of you have been doing that already, sitting here. It's like, I, I don't know if he's right, okay, right? are there spiritual forces out there and so and you're going to be sitting there while i'm preaching right here today as you should every time and you're going to be trying to distinguish is pastor bill speaking truth or is he just weird today another purpose of the distinguishing of spirits is to protect the church from heresy if somebody comes in here and tells us to drink the pink kool-aid we should have discernment as, as to whether we should drink it or not I don't know, for most of you, that's a really old thing from Jonestown. Sometime read the history books about that. We need to discern whether the source of a particular activity is actually generated by the power of the Holy Spirit or not. We don't just want to feel something on Sunday morning and go, oh, whoopee, that was really neat. We felt God. We want to know that it was the Holy Spirit that we were experiencing because we were in worship together. Are you aware of something called cessationist theology? Some of you are nodding like one or two. <laughs> there is a belief that says that at, at once the canon was all written, the Bible was written and all determined that this is the Bible, like we have it here, this Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that once that occurred, then the Holy Spirit no longer had to work in our world. He ceased to work because he didn't need to. He ceased to do supernatural things. And so all of the supernatural gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, healings, um, prophecy, tongues, all those things, they, they just ended because we didn't need them anymore because we had the Word of God. Now, the, this is a good tool, right? Really beneficial resource, really helpful to us, but we're not, we don't only want the Word, we want the living Holy Spirit who Jesus promised to come who would convict us of sin, who would lead us into truth, who would help us to distinguish, discern between good and evil. I had a lady that came with us that day, and I, like, I still remember the time. She came from Arizona, and she, did, and she said, Bill, I think it's time I'm supposed to come and share my story with your church. I'm like, oh, great. I don't know that I want her to be at our leadership retreat, um, I mean, I don't know what she'll do. <laughs> and, and she'd been through a bunch of stuff, multiple personalities, sexual abuse, um, rape, all kinds of things, uh, abortions. I mean, it just went on and on. Uh, demonic, satanic activity in her life. And I'm like, oh, okay, she's supposed to come and tell her story. Okay, Lord. So, so we allowed her to come. 
And after having shared and talked about this cessationist theology, I thought, okay, this gentleman has just shared about his seeing a demon. Um, we've just talked about the fact that, you know, are there, does the Holy Spirit still show us things and all? And I said, okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and let her tell her story. And she got up and started talking about the demonic activity in her life, her personal experience with demons, her mental is- illness. She was actually referred to as having um, disassociative identity disorder, DID for short. She had experienced um, ritual, uh, excuse me, satanic rituals and ritual abuse. And over a process of a couple of years, we helped this lady rebuke spirit, the, the Satan in her life, accept the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb of God, and be set free. And here in front of the group, she shared her story. The best part of her story was seven years earlier, she had said to Debbie and I, she said, someday I'm supposed to tell my story in front of your church. And this day she was finally telling her story in a setting where she could be accepted, where nobody was going to just, you know, think she was a strange or attacker. Uh, but where her story could bring, make a difference for a whole community. First John says, test the spirits. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. It's really basic, isn't it? Do you acknowledge Jesus or not? And you can even, you can ask a person that. You can ask a spiritual force that. Do you acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God? He came from God. And if they don't, then they're from the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world the word of God is telling us there are spiritual forces out there in the world but don't let your fears cause you to think you got to run from them the one who is in us who is the one in us The spirit of Jesus Christ dwells within every believer. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. Who's that? The demons and those and people who don't follow God who are going to say, no, we're we're not going to believe in Jesus. They're from the world. They speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. But we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. You can tell whether I'm telling you the truth today or not. The Holy Spirit will make it possible for you to recognize that. I thought it was really important when we were at that leadership retreat that we didn't just, didn't just get emotional, but we had to have principles that we could follow, not just magical formulas that we were going to somehow apply to our situation. So I suggested a simple tool for discerning spiritual truths, for, for testing the spirits. John 14, 6 says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. His truth, according to John 8, 32, sets us free in his name meaning in his authority not mine we can ask and god will respond that's john 16 24 therefore i told our leaders to simply ask jesus if something is true well that's a novel approach isn't it just ask jesus because if we can go to him we can speak in his authority in his name ask him if something is true John seems to make this a responsibility, by the way, of believers, even though it's also included in the gift list of 1 Corinthians 12. So what do you think? Can a person, can a simple person like us here in this room, can we actually discern a spiritual battle or a demonic attack without using the gift of discernment? If we all have that responsibility, then we should be able to, right? 
Now, we may want to pray for that gift of discernment, pray for that supernatural ability, but God's saying, just like any of the other things, are, are you supposed to serve even if you don't have the gift of service? Think so. Are you supposed to be able to tell other people about Jesus even if you don't have the gift of evangelism? I think so. All of us are supposed to go into all the world making disciples. Are you supposed to help people even if you don't have the gift of helps? Or here's one. Are you supposed to be hospitable to people even if you don't have the gift of hospitality? Every single one of the supernatural gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, every single one of those gifts also are spiritual responsibilities we have and we're supposed to do whether we have the supernatural ability to do that or not. Are you supposed to give even if you don't have the gift of giving? I think so. And the same thing is true of the distinguishing of spirits. We ought to do it and one of the things is simply to ask Jesus to tell us. In my study on spiritual warfare, I studied a book by a psychologist, interestingly, by a man named Dr. Peck. You've probably heard of him. He says, just as it is possible to sense the energy level in a conference room, so it is also possible for experienced individuals to sense the presence or absence of demonic energy. Now notice he, he talks it, calls it energy rather than a demon, but that's okay. This is particularly the case when he or she is praying. This is a psychologist talking, okay? Although this capacity can be developed with experience, it's not something a person can be trained to have. It's as if some people are born with a nascent capacity to discern the demonic while others are not. This is why the early Christians referred to the capacity to discern the presence of evil as a gift. It was a gift from God granted to a relative few. If you got it, you were wishing you didn't have it and granted for God's own purposes. Christianity Today uh, ran an article some years ago by a lady named Agnes, Agnieszka Tennant. And he, in it she said, open-minded but guarded humility is a good foundation for any consideration of the demonic. That type of humility embraces scrutiny as well as openness to the biblical realities playing out in today's world. In this same article, Tennant said, Christians must use their brains to learn from various disciplines, their mouths to ask God's assistance and to ask discerning questions. And yes, even the elusive medium of spiritual intuition to exercise discernment when examining claims of demonization. What do you believe about God and Satan? What do you personally believe about God, Satan, and demons? Back in 1999, George Barna did a poll and a survey on asking Christians what they believed about Satan and the Holy Spirit. In some of his earliest findings, he found that 48% either believed that Satan was only symbolic or they didn't know what he was. They didn't know what he was. Or they didn't know what he was. Or Christian of Christians believed that Satan was just a symbol, not real, or they just didn't know what he was. That was 1999. It's gotten worse. 2009... 40% of Christians strongly believe that Satan is not a living being, but just a symbol. 40% of Christians strongly believe that. An additional 20% said they agree somewhat with that perspective. We're up now to 60% that either strongly or somewhat believe Satan's just a symbol. And a minority of Christians indicated they believe Satan is real. Only 26% of Christians said that Satan is real. And an additional 9%, well, I, I think he's real. It's possible that he's real. Do you see the shift? We went from 38% to sort of thinking that 
to 60, it's almost 70% of the people, Christians thinking, uh, he's just, he's not real. He's just a symbol. Folks, we need to learn how to test the spirits. How to examine, say, are there supernatural forces? In fact, I've got eight things. If you want to write these down, these would really be great for you. These come from a gentleman named Paul Hebert. He's actually an anthropologist, quite a scholarly guy. And he said there's eight ways that we should examine something to see whether it's truth or not. You can use this here this morning. Does the finding give glory to God rather than to humans? This is what I'm talking about today, that we have the ability to distinguish, to discern, to actually pray for and test and see whether something is demonic or not. Does that give glory to God rather than to people? If I'm standing up here and saying, you know, I've got the ability to distinguish spirits and you should watch out because I can tell you who, where a demon is in this room. Okay, that doesn't sound like it's giving glory to God, does it? So does the finding give glory to God rather than to humans? Does our teaching recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ? Take a look at 1 John 2, 3 to 5. Does what we are saying, it does it recognize that Jesus is Lord? Number three, does what we discern conform to scriptural teaching? Okay, anything that, oh, they are up there, right? That's right, forgot that. We should be using the Word of God to examine anything that any teacher, preacher says, shouldn't we? And this is an incredible tool for us to test for truth, and we should use it. Four, are our leaders accountable to others in the church? Can I just tell you anything I want to tell you? Can I just, you know, or do I have an accountable relationship with other leaders in the church who will say, wait a second, Bill, you're getting weird on us. And we got to talk about how weird you're getting. I need to have that kind of accountable uh, relationship with other leaders, people of God, who are going to really test with me what, how I'm interpreting this word. Number five, do our leaders manifest the fruit of the Spirit? I said a couple of weeks ago that one of the most powerful weapons we have are listed in the fruit of the Spirit. They are supernatural. They have power against darkness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Evil has no authority against them. Use the fruit of the Spirit. Are we, the leaders of this church, using the fruit of the Spirit? When I'm preaching, am I utilizing that fruit of the Spirit as I'm speaking God's Word for us? Six, is our learning leading towards spiritual maturity? 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. There's three chapters there. What are all of the supernatural gifts given for? Even in the middle chapter there, verse th chapter 13, where it talks about love and the, and the definition of love and the importance of love. If you think about it, all those gifts are given for what purpose? For the building up of the body of Christ until we all reach maturity, as Ephesians 4 says it. So are the, the gifts and the learnings that, that we're sharing here, are they helping you to become spiritually mature? Seven, is the truth kept in balance with other truths? Okay, if, if every Sunday I'm talking about demons, we might have a problem, right? <laughs> and then we might be getting just a little bit overboard, right? But the fact is, is that there, there needs to be balance in the various teachings from the Word of God. Next Sunday, we'll be talking about confession. Notice, as we're going through spiritual warfare, there's incredible gifts that God has given to us, tools to serve Him. And number eight, are we being led to seek the unity of the body of Christ, or is it divisive? And I really hope that you don't hear from me, me talking down other Christians, other churches. Uh, I, I don't think it's helpful. Uh, I, I think that there are believers spread out throughout this world. And sometimes they're going to be in some strange places where we don't expect to find them. But the key is, do we follow Jesus Christ? So are we being led to seek the unity of the body of Christ, or is what I'm teaching divisive? So, so can we discern spirits? Can you? Can, do you have the ability to distinguish whether something is supernatural from God or not 
Well, here's my point today. We must. We have to. If we're going to know God, we've got to distinguish and discern spiritual forces, don't we? Scott Moreau, who's an evangelical, uh, teaches at, at Wheaton College, said, we must not allow our worldview to move into an unbiblical animism, and we must exercise caution in advocating techniques and strategies that resemble magic more than biblical responsible ministry. God has given Christians a significant role to play in spiritual warfare, but he calls us to wage this warfare on his terms, not ours. I don't want us to have an inappropriate focus on evil. Christ is infinitely more powerful than any form of evil. Likewise, I don't want us to miss equipping one another with spiritual weapons to do God's work. I'm convinced God is real. Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Encourager, to come alongside of us and to dwell within us and to empower us and to live in us. And we, oh, by the way, and I am convinced that Satan and demons are real as well. And we've got to be ready to stand firm and to fight the battle because we are not wrestling against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God that you can keep on standing. Can you discern spirits? Well, you've been doing it all day, haven't you? through this whole message you've been doing it do I think he's speaking truth or not is the Bible true or not is there a God or not did Jesus really die on a cross and rise from the dead and if he did Did he send his Holy Spirit? You sang that earlier. Did you notice? (laughs) You were actually making a prayer, weren't you? Be careful what you sing here, right? (laughs) When you're singing, you're making statements out loud. You know, come Holy Spirit, right? (laughs) Better watch out. (laughs) Make sure that you are testing the spirits to see if they are from God or not. And yes, evil is real. And demons attach themselves to people. And the truth is, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And therefore, we don't need to be afraid. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I hope I haven't been too clinical in trying to present something that is supernatural. And I hope that, Lord... That the evil around us will not cause us to be afraid so that we can't recognize the truth. And Spirit of God, I pray that you would remove the blinders that some of us may have about evil. Sometimes we credit simply a temptation as our battle. So we 
got the problem with the nicotine. We've got the problem with the alcohol. We've got the problem with the way we shop and the way we spend our money. We've got a problem with anger. We've got a problem with uh, abuse. So we've got uh, all different kinds, God. Oh, Lord. We don't want to ignore our responsibility, Jesus. But we also don't want to ignore and pretend that there's no evil around us. Your word's pretty clear. Greater is the one who's in us than the one who's in the world. But Lord, lots of times we are like Elisha's servant who looks out and we just see the battle and it's it's scary, it's troubling, it's something that we think we don't know how we're going to handle it. And we don't see that there are spiritual forces that are available to us as well. That there's a host, a host of the powers of heaven along with the Spirit of God that are there to assist us in that battle. So Lord, I pray that we would see, and it's interesting, Elisha prayed that the enemy would be blinded. And I pray for both of those things for us, God. That we would see and understand the truth and that the enemy would be blinded. God, for every person here today, it's not an imaginary story. It's not something that's pretend like the costumes at Hollywood, ha at Halloween. The truth is, you created this place, and you invaded it as your, as the sun, and you died on a cross, and you rose from the dead, and you are alive now, and you're inviting us to know you, to see you, to hear you, to love you, to be forgiven by you. Holy Spirit, come, show us the truth, give us eyes to see and hearts to understand and mouths to speak, ears to listen, and the ability to discern what truth is and to be set free. And if you feel like uh, maybe there's been times when you've been blinded by something, you wouldn't even call it evil. You just know there's been something that's been keeping you from knowing the truth. But that Jesus is trying to tell you today, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. Come to the Father through me. And you want to say yes to him, I just want to invite you right now. Very simple, yet it's, it's powerful. Raise your hand to say yes to Jesus. And let the powers of darkness know that Jesus, you're accepting Jesus, love and forgiveness and payment for you. Yes. Yes. God sees those hands. God, be more real for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.